Would you welcome for tonight's keynote, Mr. Shane Scott. Thank you. Twelve years ago this summer, I attended my second Harmony University. Uh, the previous year, as a rookie student, like all of us rookies, I was blown away by the expertise of the faculty, by the value of the classes, by the camaraderie of my fellow students. But I had no idea what impact the keynote speaker in 2007 would have on my barbershop experience. That was the summer Jim Henry gave his now legendary keynote address. on gold medal moments that we all experience as we use barbershop to minister to others. The speech was made even more poignant because of Jim's own deep experience of loss and the passing of his brother Rob, which was still fresh on his mind. As he spoke about the consolation that he received from barbershop and the way that his quartet, the Gas House King, had ministered to others, I had no idea that that week I would become part of a quartet that would, in its own modest way, minister to others. Nor did I imagine the valley of shadows that I would pass through and the comfort that I would draw from barbershop. That's the story I want to share with you tonight. Barbershop and broken hearts, how what we do ministers to the grieving. Let's begin with music. It's why we're all here. And in a roundabout way, it's how I became a part of the faculty. My third year as a student, I realized if I wanted to keep coming to HU, I either had to pass Music Theory 4 <laughs> or weasel my way onto the faculty. <laughs> I chose the latter. <laughs> the proposal I concocted was based on books like Daniel Levitin's This Is Your Brain on Music, and Oliver Sacks' Musicophilia, books that explored questions I had nearly all my life. Why, as a toddler, did I spontaneously burst into tears when I heard somber classical music playing? Why did I giggle like a little schoolboy the first time I heard a voice in a barbershop chord? These are experiences all of us here have shared. To my surprise, my proposal was accepted, and every other year or so, we offer a course on This Is Your Brain on Music. Among the fascinating topics we discuss in class is what makes sad songs sad. In our culture, we sometimes think that if it, a song is in a minor key, then it's sad, but that's hardly universal. In many cultures, that's not the case at all. But what does seem to be universal is that sad songs emulate the sounds of sadness, like weeping, and have a plaintive color to them. Another topic we discuss in that class is why we tend to gravitate towards sad songs when we're sad. A quick story. A few years ago, a dear friend of mine invited me to be in his wedding. I was glad to do so, but I was apprehensive because at the time I was single. And those of you who are single understand the kinds of questions you get when you go to a wedding as someone older and unwed. The barrage of, so when are you going to get married? As if it's as easy as ordering a pizza. And on top of that, I had just gotten to know a young lady that I found very attractive in every way and who had become a dear friend but who I knew would always and only see me as just a friend. So with that on my mind, I drove from Nashville to Northwest Indiana, where I did indeed face the relentless questioning. It was a happy day, but it was a sad one. And on the way home, I knew exactly what would get me through the long drive on I-65. I pulled off into a shopping center to find a song, one song, my heart needed. I found Michael Bublé's version, which was okay. <laughs> I needed a voice that drew upon years of pain to convey what I felt.
song by that singer? Well, for one thing, Ray Charles seems to wail as he sings, almost as if he's crying with me. And for another thing, the lyrics assure me that I'm not alone in feeling unrequited love. Somebody else has felt the same thing. And somehow, he's reached the point of acceptance where he could write a song about it or sing about it. That's why we find sad songs so cathartic. They ground us, they empathize with us, and they move us along the path to acceptance. So paradoxically, when we sing, when we are sad, we need sad songs to feel better. But that wasn't the most unexpected discovery I made in preparation for my classes here at HU. That happened when I began teaching the class on comedy. What makes something funny? Philosophers have theorized all sorts of answers, but the best way to analyze comedy is just to experience it. Like this clip from The Three Amigos. <laughs> well, what makes this funny? Well, we're led to believe these men will assuage their thirst in the desert with the sun beating down on them and the caked desert floor. But that's not what happens. Steve Martin's character gets a trickle of water. Martin shorts a mouthful of sand. But when Chevy Chase opens his cantina, it gushes out water. And yet, rather than do what we would expect and share it, once he's finished drinking all he can, he just casually tosses the canteen aside as the other three watch aghast as water just pours out onto the desert floor. And, and at the end, when he finally does acknowledge them, rather than give them something to drink, he offers them lip balm. Well, this reversal of expectations is what those who study comedy call incongruity. And while human psychology is too complicated to explain by just one theory of comedy, this concept of incongruity goes a long way toward explaining why we find things funny. Especially when the incongruity takes the form of violating expected social norms. Here's an old joke. Guy's driving down the road, his car breaks down by a farm, he gets out, sees the farmer to ask him for help, and notices a three-legged pig. 
he asked the farmer, tell me how this pig get three legs. The farmer says, well, this pig's pretty amazing. I was on the back 40. My tractor turned over on me. This pig came, pulled me out from under. Oh, the tractor crushed his leg. No. Well, what happened? Oh, well, then one time a fox attacked the hen house. This brave pig charged, fought off the fox, saved all the hens. Oh, he, the fox took his leg. No. Well, what happened? Oh, and then we had a fire one time, and this pig scrambled upstairs in the house, alerted all of us, and saved us. So his leg burned off. No, that's not it either. Well, tell me, why does this pig have three legs? Well, mister, a pig as good as that you don't eat all at once. <laughs> Now, what makes this joke funny and makes you groan at the same time is that it violates what we would expect to happen to such a noble and heroic pig, incongruity. And to the extent that humor is predicated on the violation of expectations, there's always the potential for offense to be taken. I don't think it's ethical for comedians to go out of their way to be cruel <coughs> and malicious. But I got to tell you, neither is it helpful or healthy to always look to be offended. Because good comedy acknowledges that life itself can be offensive. This joke about the pig is not just a joke. Some of you in this room have dedicated your lives to a job that has consumed you bit by bit only to let you go for no reason. Some of you have pledged your love to someone who it turns out did not reciprocate. Some of you have waited your whole life to find the person of your dreams to lose them to cancer. Comedy speaks to us at a profound level because life itself is incongruous, because life does not go as it should. Victor Borga once said, humor is something that thrives between man's aspirations and his limitations. There is more logic in humor than in anything else because, you see, humor is truth. When we shut ourselves off from the truth that comedy conveys because we are eager to find something offensive, we deny ourselves the healing power that comedy equips us with to come to grips with life. So music is healing. And comedy is healing. When you combine music and comedy, you express truths that can touch people at the deepest level. And no art form does that better than barbershop. Back to that 2007 Harmony University. That same week, some friends and I from the Music City Chorus here in Nashville decided to put together a pickup quartet to have fun at our Dixie Fall Contest. So Drew Ellis, Mike O'Neill, Eddie Holt, and I met every day during lunch at HU to work on ideas. Cindy Hansen Ellis was there that year and graciously volunteered her time to give us some much-needed coaching. To our surprise, a few months later, we won our district contest and started getting show bids. Our second show was in Warren, Pennsylvania. And that night after the show, an older woman came up to us and said that her husband had passed away many months prior, and she had not been able to laugh since then until that night. And she thanked us. I was perplexed because when I heard Jim Henry talk about music as a ministry, I assumed it was serious music he had in mind. Only much later, when I studied the psychology of humor, did I come to understand why a silly comedy quartet would have moments like we did that night in Warren, Pennsylvania, moments replicated many times over in our travels around the world. One story that stands out to me was on a show a few years ago when a fellow barbershopper came up to us in tears and explained that one day in the grip of depression, he was planning to take his life when for some reason he decided to go out and check his mailbox and saw that our DVD had been delivered and he popped it in and watched it and he said he laughed and cried like a baby and then he said to me, your DVD saved my life. It was amazing to me. And in the years we traveled widely on the show circuit, we often heard stories like this as people shared with us how our music lifted them out of despondency. Now, to be fair, 
Many music and singing judges told us that listening to our music had the opposite effect on them. <laughs> But my point is that we in Barbershop are uniquely equipped to minister to the grieving, particularly when Barbershop combines music, comedy, and, speaking of some violations of social norms, animals with deformities. <laughs> By the time we ramped up for the 2011 contest, we had a new baritone. Drew had moved away and a newcomer to our chorus, K.J. McAleese Jurgen, stepped in to replace him. We also had a new idea given to us by our coach, Rick LaRosa. It was from a song by a comedian named Seamus Kennedy, which he called Old McDonald's Deformed Farm. Many of his animals were inappropriate for a general audience, but we thought the concept was hilarious. All we had to do was come up with our own rendition of <coughs> deformed animals. But remember, <laughs> Humor is based on incongruity, on benign violations. And what one person finds benign, another may find malicious. So as we created our list of potential deformed animals, we asked for feedback from a wide array of coaches and judges, teachers, even parents of children with special needs, just to make sure we were not crossing the line. We even wrote an introduction that begins the song by making fun of our own deformities. Eddie grew up stuttering, Mike has OCD, I'm fat, and KJ is an idiot. So that's how we started the song. So with all of this feedback, we were ready to debut Old McDonald on our chapter show here in Nashville. We were all in the chorus. So we took our place on the risers for the first half chorus portion of the show, so excited to get to intermission, change into our quartet costumes, and then go out and lay it on the audience. And as the show was about to start, all of us from the risers could see a group of about 20 special needs children string in and take their seats on the very front row. <laughs> We got back to intermission, terrified. We debated what we should do. But we decided we know what we mean by this song. And if there's anyone in the audience who will appreciate its cartoonish nature, it'll be those kids. So we went out and started the song. And at first, I heard from right down here what I thought was wailing. And I was petrified. But then I glanced down and... This child was not crying, he was bent over double laughing, convulsing with laughter. All of them were. I'll never forget the reaction of those kids that night. It was awesome. And after the show, their teacher came up to Eddie and made a point to thank him for the song. I know a lot of you don't know what I'm talking about, and I know a lot of you have seen us do Old MacDonald, but you may not have noticed that there is a very serious message at the start of the last verse. Oh, well, you know what they say, in some way, variety makes living life so grand. All creatures, great and small, we love them all. At Old MacDonald's farm, we all can have a ball. That's what the song means to us. None of us is perfect. We all have our own idiosyncrasies, our own flaws, our own deformities. But in that song, we want to create a place where everyone can come together and in spite of their imperfections, in fact, because of them, celebrate. As KJ says when he introduces the song on our shows, that's what we have all found in the world of barbershop. And that's the world I got to introduce to my wife. This was my wife, Christy. I know what you're thinking. Whenever anyone sees this picture, they always say the same thing the same way. She's beautiful, as if to say, number one, that's a gorgeous woman, and number two, how did you marry her? <laughs> and all I can say on Sunday to the congregation is amen. <laughs> as we in SEC football country would say, I outkicked the coverage big time. <laughs> I 
Christy and I started dating in February of 2010, and by that summer, things were getting so serious, she wanted to come to the International Convention in Philadelphia. I was anxious as to how my new love would take the new strange world of barbershop. Fortunately, Christy's summer vacations as a child revolved around her father's conventions. He was a professor of accounting, and every summer... <laughs> And every summer dragged the family to the Institute of Management Accountants annual meeting. I was sure we could beat that one. Well, that year in Philly, after a few days, I said, so what do you think? And her immediate first impression was that even though you guys all compete against each other, you are all so supportive of one another. Now, of course, as time went on, she learned what those of you new to barbershop will also learn, that there is unfortunately a little segment of our world that loves to troll fellow barbershoppers and finds pleasure in mocking and fixating on the faults of others. Those people may deserve our pity, but they deserve none of our attention because they are the antithesis, the bizarro world version of the very thing I'm talking about tonight. And fortunately, they are a minor fraction of the world my wife came to know and love. Christy and I dated for a year and a half and married on August 29th, 2011, surrounded by our friends and family, including all the members of lunch break. Christy and I had waited a long time to get married. We were thrilled to begin our new life together for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Two days before our first anniversary, those vows took on a new significance. Just a few blocks from here, a doctor informed us that Christy had cancer, advanced colorectal cancer. We were supposed to travel that week to the Labor Day Jamboree in Florida, and then, after singing with the quartet, jump on a cruise to celebrate our first anniversary. Instead, we marked our first year of marriage by a flurry of doctor's appointments, tests, and exams. After several rounds of chemo and radiation and surgery, we had hoped that the tumor and cancer were gone forever. But two years later, those hopes unraveled when we learned that the cancer had returned and metastasized. We had only been married three years at that point, and now we were told that we probably had less than that left. Incongruity. The reversal of expectations. The violation of norms. That's life. Here's what helped us to deal with it. First and foremost, our faith. Not that God would keep us from the trial ahead, but that would he, he would sustain us while we endured it. And then all of the great blessings I've already talked about tonight, which I may see as divine gifts and someone else may see as fortuitous gifts, but we all see as gifts. Music, comedy, and barbershop. You may not think there's anything funny about cancer, but the reality is a form like colorectal cancer presents all sorts of awkward and embarrassing moments that you just have to shake your head at and laugh about. When Christie's surgeon, whose name was Dr. Polk, explained that her... <laughs> when he explained that her temporary colostomy bag would be a challenge and then after it was removed, she would never have normal bowel movements, she began to refer to a successful one as having a Dr. Polk. It was silly and juvenile and ridiculous, but so was getting that kind of cancer at her age. So we found things to laugh about, to deal with the absurdity of it all. And we found solace in music, especially in songs that implored us to keep fighting. Like last year in Orlando when Vaktif sang The Impossible Dream. Got to see it side by side. And we drew comfort from barbershop. At the Labor Day Jamboree in 2017, Christy felt like coming over for a night. And she sat with me as we heard Double Date sing these words. 
If it seems that everything is lost, I will smile and never count the cost if you love me, really love me. Let it happen, darling. I won't care. And then Mike Slamka came up and hugged us because, as he said, it looked like we needed it. Which goes to show that as great as barbershop is, what's even greater is barbershoppers. Last October, we traveled here to Nashville to meet with a doctor to talk about a potential new clinical trial. After we finished the paperwork, we headed over to the Smoky Mountains. It's where we honeymooned. It was our sanctuary to recharge our batteries before Christy was to begin the new treatment. We just didn't realize that by that point, the cancer was progressing at a breakneck speed. After just two days in our cabin, I had to rush Christy to the hospital. She had fought courageously and for much longer than her prognosis, but the fight was about to end. Our last day together was filled with everything I've talked with you about tonight. Music, comedy, barbershop. When the guys on lunch break realized how gravely critical Christie's condition was, they made arrangements to get to us as fast as they could. That final day, the boys, the boys visited Christy to say goodbye to her and to strengthen me for what lay ahead. Barbershoppers are the best part of barbershop. And there was lots of music. Along with Christie's family, many of our church friends came together with hymnals. We blended our voices and bared our souls to the Lord. And believe it or not, even on the last day, there was comedy and it came from Christy. Because of our situation, we had talked a little bit about Christy's arrangements. I knew she wanted to be cremated, but I didn't know much more and things had changed so quickly, we really hadn't planned anything out. So the last day, knowing our time was running out, I said, Christy, I know you want to be cremated, but I don't know much more. And her lungs were compromised to the point she couldn't talk much. So I said, I'm going to list some options and you squeeze my hand when it's the one you want. Do you want me to spread your ashes, maybe here in the Smoky Mountains or in Hawaii? No response. Do you want me to take your urn back up to your home state, Illinois, or back here to Nashville? Nothing. Do you want me to find a nice mausoleum in Florida? Do you want me to just keep them with me at home? She squeezed my hand. And then she looked up, and she locked her eyes with mine, and she smiled real big, and she said, to bother you. <laughs> if I told you no other story to explain why I admired that woman so much, the courage and grace and love in that simple moment of humor says it all. 4.30 the next morning, most beautiful person I've ever known passed from this life. But I wasn't alone. In the days following, music, comedy, barbershop continued to minister to me. When I got back to Florida, I took some friends from church to go see Hello Dolly, where I heard once again lyrics that Christy and I treasured. It only takes a moment to be loved a whole life long. The power of music to help process sorrow came home vividly to me this spring, one Sunday afternoon, when I laid down to take a nap and couldn't sleep because all I could think of was how much I wish Christy was in bed with me. And overcome, I just blurted out, my Christy, I loved loving you. And later that day, I began to sing those words. And that night, I began to try to, in my not passing music theory for a way, tried to write some chords, and I put some chords together, and I sent them to my friend, to Manoj, to make a, a beautiful manuscript. I'd like to teach you this tag. Does anybody have a C? Lead your part is this. My Christy, I love loving you. Basses, 
my Christy, I loved loving you, loving you, loving you. Baritones, my Christy, I loved loving you, loving you, loving you. Tenors, my Christy, I loved loving you, loving you, loving you. Would you sing this with me, please? I Creating this tag, oh, thank you. <laughs> Creating this tag helped me to process what I felt that sleepless afternoon. These chords, in my mind at least, reflected our marriage. Some of them are sweet. Some of them sound sad to me. But they all sound beautiful to me. In the days after Christie's passing, there was also comedy, particularly provided by a night of storytelling from some dear friends I've made through my time on the faculty here at HU. They had come to Orlando to judge and coach at our fall contest and stayed over to have some fun. They, they asked me to come over and join them and hang out. I don't think I've ever laughed more or needed to laugh more than that night with this group of people many of whom I'm looking at right now. And on top of this, there was the generosity of barber shoppers all around the world who contributed to a GoFundMe account set up by KJ. The donations came in so fast, I couldn't possibly keep up with all the contributors, but I did manage to notice the incredible diversity of those who gave their hard-earned dollars to help me and Christy. From the deeply religious to the decidedly unreligious, Far left wing, far right wing, straight, gay, all points along the spectrum. It reinforced my belief that barbershop is one of the last places left where those who disagree profoundly about matters of conviction can come together and temporarily lay aside those differences and connect at the deepest level of our shared humanity and just crush a chord. <laughs> and also help a friend. And that's something our country desperately needs right now. This Tuesday will mark the nine month anniversary of Christie's passing. I can't say that my broken heart is mended, just mending, but I now know firsthand what Jim Henry meant 12 years ago when he concluded his keynote address by saying about the ministry of barbershop, this, this is, is our, our calling. calling. It, it is, is our ministry, ministry. And, and it, it is, is an, awesome, an one. awesome one. Because I stand before you tonight as someone forever grateful to have been blessed by the ministry of Barbershop. I know that many of you can tell the same story. I thank you for letting me share mine. And one last thing. Christy, you once told me it was remarkable how supportive of one another barbershoppers can be. I had no idea how right you were. 